Hello, welcome to a pretty cold week four. It's going to be cold today, tomorrow, this weekend, so make sure you have a coat and bundle up. We're going to talk about Imperial America today. Uh, a lot of people don't consider America an imperial power, but at the late 1800s, early 1900s, it definitely was, and parts of that imperialism can still be seen today. Now, Let's start kind of with the roots of expansion, and you see a picture there, uh, if you're wondering who that is, that is Teddy Roosevelt, and he had a big role in this expansion of power the United States sees. And this interest in growing an overseas empire is really going to begin in the late 1800s, and there's a couple different reasons for this. One big reason is religious leaders, and some of these religious leaders were racist, as you've seen in some of the previous videos. Uh, there was this argue that it was the mission of the United States to spread Christianity to civilizations that were seen as inferior or backwards. Uh, manifest destiny or the white man's burden are the two easiest ways to, to wrap your head around this. Um, there's also the idea that other countries are doing it. Japan was doing it, creating an empire. Britain had an empire. Even the Netherlands and Belgium had an empire. And so people in the United States say, well, if they can do it, we can do it too. This is also going to be right in the middle of the scramble for Africa. Um, the idea of colonizing Africa has just gotten going and people in the United States are seeing Africa slowly being carved up. There's a third reason and it's a book. In 1890, a, an author named Alfred Mahan wrote The Influence of Sea Power on History. And in this book, Mahan, he equates naval strength with national greatness. Basically, if you have a powerful navy, that means you have a powerful country. And Mahan's going to argue that the United States needs overseas colonies to provide naval bases. So to have a powerful navy, you have to have navy bases. And to be a powerful country, you have to have a powerful navy. In other words, think of these navy bases that are going to be all over the country, or I should say all over the world, like gas stations. The U.S. Navy was going to need places where it could get off the boat, refuel the ships, give the men some rest and relaxation, and then continue on. And this idea of expansion is going to become one of the main ideas of the Republican Party of its day. So Teddy Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, John Hay, three very big names in the Republican Party in the late 1800s, early 1900s, are all going to say, we need to be a strong country, we need to build a strong navy, and we need to expand. Very famously, Teddy Roosevelt, he's going to have the saying, walk softly and carry a big stick. And Roosevelt's going to rebuild the U.S. Navy. It's called the Great White Fleet. And he is going to sail this U.S. Navy around the world to show that America is a real threat and a real power. Well, the beginnings of expansion are going to begin in the late 1870s in the Pacific Ocean. In 1879, the United States, along with Germany and Great Britain, are going to form a protectorate over the Samoan Islands. Basically, these three countries agree to protect the Samoan Islands from outside threats. What were those outside threats? Nobody really knew. And the Samoans did not ask for protection. But regardless, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States all agree to protect the Samoan Islands. By 
1889, the United States and Germany formally declare Samoa a colony, and even today in 2021, the American Samoa is still part of the United States. Moving on from there, in 1893, American sugar planters who have settled in Hawaii overthrow the, the monarchy of Hawaii. Now, American-born plantation owners had set up in Hawaii as early as the 1830s. Hawaii was a very good place to grow things like pineapple and sugar. And by the time we get to 1888, there's a rebellion. Sanford Dole, who was part of the Dole Fruit Company, leads this rebellion. And in 1893, uh, Queen Lilikalani is overthrown. Now, what these planters want is to become part of the United States. And when the rebellion happens, and in 1893, when the Queen is overthrown, Sanford Dole and these other rebellious planters ask the United States for annexation, basically making Hawaii part of a territory. In 1893, the gentleman who was president at the time was Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland said, absolutely not. What you did was undemocratic. And Hawaii is going to stay independent of the United States until 1898. In 1898, President William McKinley and Congress decide to annex Hawaii into the United States following something called the Spanish-American War. Speaking of the Spanish-American War, we got to look at Cuba. Um, there's this crisis over Cuba, and in 1895, Cubans are going to revolt against Spanish rule. Now, Cuba was the last Spanish colony, and in 1895, the Cubans revolt. The Spanish military's commander was a guy named Valeriano Valer or Whaler. And Whaler, or Valer, however you say his name, is going to suppress the rebellion pretty much by any means necessary. And estimates are somewhere around 200,000 Cubans are going to die in this rebellion. Well, this rebellion is going to make it into American news, and it's going to really upset people here in the United States. And the reason is just like Americans had set up shop in Hawaii, U.S. businesses had heavily invested in Cuba. Over 90% of all sugar plantations in Cuba were American-owned, and sugar was the number one industry on the island. So American investors did not want to see a Cuban revolution destroy all their investments. This is where the idea of yellow journalism comes in. That might be a phrase you've heard in the past, but you may not really understand what it is. In yellow journalism, they were made up stories, like completely made up, or sensationalized stories, exaggerated stories. And the journal by William Randolph Hearst and the world by Joseph Pulitzer very often wrote these sensationalized or these exaggerated articles about Cuba. And they made Spain's actions and Valor's tactics look immoral, backwards, more barbaric than they probably actually were. Things are not helped along when on February 15th, 1898, the U.S. battleship Maine explodes in the harbor of Havana. 226 Navy soldiers are killed. U.S. Navy 
newspapers instantly point their finger at the Spanish. These yellow journalism stories go crazy. And before you know it, the American public demands war with Spain. In fact, remember the main becomes this popular slogan and this national cry against Spain. And you can see with these two pictures um, how geared towards war the United, the United States got very, very quickly. So the Spanish-American War, it's going to break out in 1898. And on April 11th, 1898, then President William McKinley will go to Congress and ask Congress to declare war against Spain. Congress is going to agree with a couple of stipulations. The first stipulation is that Congress says Cuba will be an independent nation. Cuba will not become a colony of the United States. Cuba will be an independent nation. Furthermore, Congress is going to pass something called the Teller Amendment. And the Teller Amendment is going to say that the United States does not want any control over Cuba. That's not their goal. Their goal is just to help the Cubans achieve their independence from a hostile power. Now, this war is going to last a total of three months. Uh, John Hay, who was the Secretary of State under William McKinley, is going to actually call it a splendid little war, almost like he didn't take it seriously. And the action begins on May 1st. On May 1st, the U.S. Navy is going to sail not to Cuba, but to the Philippines. And the U.S. Navy is going to sail into Manila Bay. And the United States Navy is going to capture 10 ships of the Spanish fleet or destroy 10 ships of the Spanish fleet. Only one American is killed in this battle. The United States Army is going to occupy Manila in August of 1898. And the United States will not leave. Finally, in late June, American troops land in Cuba for the first time. And July 1st, U.S. troops are going to capture Spanish defensive positions. And these Spanish positions, they are the ones that guard Santiago de Cuba, which was the most important port city of the time where most of the Spanish Navy was or Spanish military, I should say. On July 3rd, the Spanish Navy tries to leave Cuba and go back to Spain, but the American Navy has surrounded Cuba and does not let the Spanish Navy leave. Spanish control over Cuba and the Spanish position in all of the Americas ends as a result of basically these two days, three days of battle. Ultimately, this Spanish-American War will end with the Treaty of Paris in 1898. And at the Treaty of Paris 1898, Spain recognizes Cuban independence. The United States officially gets control of the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And then for their trouble, the United States is going to pay uh, Spain $20 million. The United States is going to keep the Philippines until July 4th, 1946. The United States still controls Puerto Rico, and there are questions on whether Puerto Rico should or should not be a state. The United States still controls Guam. Guam is a territory of the United States. The people of Guam are U.S. citizens. And that's today in 2021. Now, you remember that Teller Amendment? 
yeah, we don't listen to it. We don't agree to it. Despite the Teller Amendment, the United States is going to stay involved in Cuba until the Communist Revolution in 1959. In fact, in 1901, the Platt Amendment is signed. And what the Platt Amendment does, it authorizes American withdrawal from Cuba only if and only when Cuba agrees to future U.S. intervention, meaning the United States can come back and interfere whenever it wants to. The United States also demands land for a Navy base. That Navy base is today the base at Guantanamo Bay. It was originally supposed to just be for 99 years, but when the Communist Revolution happens, the United States says, we're going to keep it forever. And the U.S. does reoccupy Cuba more than once. From 1906 to 1909, the United States has control of Cuba and reinvades. And then again in 1912. All of this is going to bring Cuba closer and closer and closer to the United States. And while Cuba does remain an independent nation up until the Cuban Revolution with Fidel Castro in the late 90, uh, 1950s, early 1960s, Cuba acted like an American territory. All right, back to the Pacific Ocean. We got to talk about this some more. Uh, the Philippines is not all roses and ponies or, or anything like that. In 1899, this guerrilla war against the United States breaks out, and it lasts until 1903. These business leaders and these expansionist believers convince William McKinley to keep the Philippines, and you're going to read an article this week about that decision that McKinley has to make. Well, the main reason it's kept is because it's near China, and China was seen as this emerging and growing market. And McKinley says, hey, it's a good idea. We should keep this so we're closer to China. Well, the Filipinos didn't like that. And in 1899, Emilio Aguinaldo leads a revolt for independence against the U.S. Army. This war lasts about four years. The United States loses about 4,000 soldiers. Filipinos, however, lose at least 10,000 men. And if you include civilians, the actual losses are closer to 50,000. Guerrilla warfare means it's not regular army units. It's involving the entire population. So it's 10,000 men lost in open battle by the Filipinos, up to 50,000 if you include the losses of civilians. Now we have to look at China too, and you have to talk about the Boxer Rebellion in China. This is something that's covered more heavily in world history too than it is U.S. history too, but it's still important to know. Uh, there's a rebellion in 1900 against outsiders, against Western influence. Russia... Germany, France, Japan, and Britain had all kind of carved out these spheres of influence, meaning these territories that were still meant parts of China, but the European powers had like exclusive rights to do business in them. And in 1899, Secretary of State John Hay is going to send notes to... Russia, Germany, France, Japan, and Britain saying, hey, uh, you can't carve up the country like this. You have to leave China open to trade. Well, in the middle of John, John Hay, I should not be John Jay, sorry about that, I'll fix it later, but John Hay, H-A-Y, in the middle of John Hay sending out these letters and trying to do this negotiating, these rebellious boxers these members of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists overthrow the Chinese government, kill thousands of foreigners, kill thousands of Christians, and burn down the city of Beijing, the capital city. When that happens, this international army is put together. 
members of the Russian army, German army, Japanese army, British army, American army, and some others join together 2,500 U.S. Marines help invade China and put down the rebellion. Now, after the rebellion is put down, a lot of the other powers want to carve China up and turn China into a series of colonies, much like was happening in Africa. But John Hay is going to do more negotiating in the background and convince all these European Western style powers that China is better off independent. So China's going to stay independent, but just barely. And China is forever weakened up until fairly modern times, the 1980s and beyond. There are some other issues going on uh, surrounding this idea of imperialism. In 1899, the Anti-Imperialist League is formed to argue against American imperialism. And there are some very famous names in this group, such as John Adams, Grover Cleveland, Samuel Gompers, um, Andrew Carnegie. They're all against this idea of imperialism. William Jennings Bryan is a member of it. Mark Twain is a member of it, too. And they're all going to argue that imposing U.S. rule on other people by military force violates the American ideals. It violates the Declaration of Independence. You also have the Panama Canal that's going to be created and built. Uh, the Panama Canal is going to be taken over in 1903 due to a failed French company. There's this company that is French, is trying to build the canal. It goes out of business. Uh, John Hay is going to make an agreement with Colombia called the Hay-Heron Agreement, where Colombia is going to give the United States a lease for the canal. The United States is going to build the canal and operate the canal. Well, the Colombian Senate refuses because Colombia knows how valuable this will be. That's okay. The United States, led by President Teddy Roosevelt, is going to encourage the people to revolt against the government. President Roosevelt is going to help incite a revolt in the Panama part of Colombia. And this rebellion is going to be successful in November of 1903, partially because Roosevelt sends the U.S. Navy to the coast of Panama. Well, guess what happens? The minute the rebellion starts, the U.S. is going to recognize Panama as an independent nation. And when the rebellion succeeds, Panama gives the canal to the United States. In fact, Panama didn't just give the canal to the United States, but Panama gave a 10-mile wide piece of land to the United States. And that remains U.S. territory until the late 90s, if I remember correctly. People born in the Panama Canal Zone were American citizens. Former Senator John McCain was born in the Panama Canal Zone, and he was a U.S. citizen and could run for president. Now, U.S. companies, they begin construction of the canal in 1906. They complete it in 1914. The rest is history there. The other thing that happens is the Roosevelt Corollary. This goes along with the Monroe Doctrine that you may have learned about previously, where um, James Monroe says that the New World is closed to further colonization. Well, the Roosevelt Corollary that's issued by Teddy Roosevelt, he's going to say the U.S. has a right to intervene in Latin American countries to keep order and see that foreign debts are paid. So in other words, not only is the New World closed to new colonization, but Starting in the early 1900s, the United States will be the policeman of the new world. It will make sure that all debts are paid. The United States is going to make good on this. The United States is going to get involved in Latin American countries repeatedly. Uh, the United States has been involved in Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Haiti. Uh, it's going to get involved in Grenada. It's going to get involved in Panama. You name it. 
And the United States has been involved in some way, shape, or form in Latin American countries since the Roosevelt Corollary was passed. Okay. For this week, we're on week four. You have your chapter 19 discussion. You have your chapter 19 quiz. Everybody should have turned in the reflection paper already. I will be honest, probably a third of you didn't, which is not a great way to start. So let's make good. Let's have everybody turn in chapter 19 work for week four. Uh, one note I do want to say about last week's discussion on races in the United States. Uh, a very key thing that people missed was the fact that where people were coming from changed during that time that article was talking about. In the beginning, uh, immigrants came from Western Europe. They were seen as the same as people from America. The German people, the Irish people, the English people were all kind of seen as equals, although the Irish were the least equal of them. But over time, going into the 1900s, immigration started coming from Southern Europe, Central Europe, and Eastern Europe, and each one of those groups was seen as lower than the other. So that was the biggest takeaway that I think people missed from the Races in the United States article. Now, for this week's articles, let me pull them up for you. I want to show you what you're reading. Lessons, we're on lesson four, American Empire. For this week's reading, you have something called Imperial of decadence. And what's really re unique about this, it was written by a gentleman named Francisco Garcia Calderon. And Calderon is not American. He's actually from Peru. He was the Peruvian diplomat. So when you read Imperialism of Decadence, you're looking at an opinion of the United States from somebody from South America. So if it looks a little bit negative towards the United States, it is because it's written by somebody who feels the United States is stomping on them, if you will. The other reading, McKinley Defense Expansionism. This is William McKinley trying to give and provide his rationale as to why it was okay to keep the Philippines. Now, last but not least, because we're coming up on the 30 minute mark, a couple weeks ago, I said that I would occasionally give extra credit. This is one of those choices. If you can send me in Blackboard a message with the following word by Friday night at 9 p.m., I will give you five extra points on your week three quiz. What is that word? The word is bluey, B-L-U-E-Y. So once again, the word is bluey, B-L-U-E-Y. If you can send me a message by Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time with the word Bluey, B-L-U-E-Y, I will give you five extra points on your week three quiz. Now, you may ask why the word Bluey, B-L-U-E-Y? It's because, quite frankly, it's my three-year-old kid's favorite TV show. And if you haven't seen it, it's pretty good. All right, until next time, we'll see you later. Any questions, feel free to, to email, and I'll answer you. Bye-bye.